Well, good morning. It's a blessing to be here together this morning, to sing together, and to be gathered uh, around the Lord's table. It is by His invitation that we are here this morning and beginning our week in this way. I like to say that this is the foundation upon which we need to build our week. It is a foundation of grace, a foundation of, of love, and a foundation of, of truth. As the Lord Jesus came into this world and gave his life for us to redeem us to our God. And so, built upon that foundation, I think we can face whatever the week has ahead of us. And so, thank you for being here this morning. I want to begin this morning by uh, going to our Father in prayer. Let's bow together, please. Our great Lord and God, our Creator and Maker, Father, we are here this morning delighting to give you praise as we already have in the singing of these songs. And Father, at the same time, we come empty, we come hungry, we come, some of us, feeling lost and in need of direction. And so we come here, Father, asking that you might fill us strengthen us, and show us the way. And we pray that you will do that in this hour as we gather around this table, as we gather around your word and our new Bible classes, and as we engage in prayer and praise and song in the next hour. Thank you, Lord, for being with us, for drawing us together here and making us a family. We ask it all in the name of our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, um, I want to talk to you this morning about bread. Um, bread is perhaps one of the most common foods in the world, always has been, certainly in ancient uh, Jewish society that was the, the staple of their diet. They would sometimes have some fish, um, occasionally other meats around times of sacrifice, but mostly maybe some cheese and some eggs and things of that sort for their protein, but primarily their, their, their diet was uh, bread-based. And um, when you and I want some bread, and I, I love bread, in fact, the smell of Hot bread in the oven is one of the best smells in the world, isn't it? Um, but we often don't bake our own bread. If you do, you probably go to the store and buy some flour that's already prepared for the making of, of bread. And you mix it with, I don't know, I've never made bread. I guess you mix it with some, put some water in there and some salt and maybe some oil or something of that kind. And, and you put it in the oven and, and you you have bread. But most of the time, we just run down to uh, Walmart or Kroger or Meyer, wherever you do your shopping, and you just grab a loaf of bread off of the bread aisle, or maybe you go and get some brown and serve rolls, or maybe some of those Sister Schuberts. I don't know who Sister Schubert was, but I like her. Uh, and you put those in the oven, and they are so delicious. But bread for us comes easy, and we kind of, like so many things in our modern world, just take it for granted. There it is. But the ancient world was much closer to its food, lived much closer to its food source, and was much more engaged in the process or the processing of their food than maybe we are today. When they wanted to have bread, they were well aware that there was a, a lengthy process involved with that. You had to grow, grow the grain, and uh, then there had to be the harvest of the grain, and they would by hand go out, not in their fancy combine and drive through the, the field, but they would go out by hand and with a, uh, um, a sickle, they would cut the wheat, the heads of the wheat off from the stalk gather those into sheaves, and then go through a rather lengthy and arduous process of thrashing the wheat. Th 
thrashing the wheat. That's, that, that's a word that kind of sounds like what it, what it is. It's a, it's a term of, of a violent shaking of sorts in which there would be over the process of this violent shaking, this thrashing, a separation of the kernel of grain from the chaff that it had grown up with in the plant. And so eventually you would have your grain separated from the chaff, but your process for making bread has only just begun because now you have to grind it. Generally, in some kind of a wheel made of stone, two, two circular stones that would be turned and the, the grain poured into the middle and then work its way out and eventually down and come out as flour on the other side. Or perhaps you would get a bowl and a, what do you call that, a, a mortar and pestle uh, like pharmacists use, and you would crush the grain over and over and over and grind it until finally it was fine enough to be used for flour. Then you would mix it up and bake it, and you would have your bread. Even in the wilderness, when the children of Israel were for 40 years dependent upon God providing miraculously manna for them there, I used to, for years, I think it was just this past year in doing the Bible reading that it, it, I finally noticed this verse, but I had always just sort of assumed that manna just came ready to eat. <laughs> It was just like going down to the store and getting your loaf of bread. It was just ready as it was. But apparently that's not the case because it says in Numbers 11, beginning in verse 7, that the manna was like coriander seed and its appearance was like that of bedelium. Don't you love it when the Bible uses words you don't know to de describe other things you don't know? Apparently it's like a resin, a, a yellowish color, sort of clear, partially transparent substance that they could... Could, could pick up off the ground, but like coriander seed. And then it says in verse 8, and the people went about and gathered it and ground it in hand mills or beat it in mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. So there was a process, a processing of the resource uh, of the, the, into a commodity in order to make it into to bread. And it was, again, a, a violent process of, of grinding, of beating in order that it could become flour. Now, we know that there's a strong connection in the Bible between Jesus and bread. Um, he was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And of course, one of his greatest miracles was performed uh, in the taking of a little boy's lunch, his five barley loaves, and multiplying that food into enough to feed a crowd of thousands. And it was in the context of that, following up on it the next day, when the people were in pursuit of him for more of that bread that he had provided the day before, that Jesus began the famous sermon in which he refers to himself repeatedly as the bread of life. And in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 27, he says, Do not work for the food that spoils but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is, to, is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign will you give us that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Isn't it uh, a fitting 
metaphor that Jesus would liken himself to bread, to specifically the bread that, that came down in the wilderness, miraculously provided from heaven for the sustenance of the people during their sojourn between Egypt and the promised land. That, that, that he also, coming from heaven, is to be life for the world and that he would give his life for ours in the greatest exchange in the history of the world. And when we look at Jesus, we see the one who can give us not satisfaction the way that the things of the earth give us satisfaction. We work hard for our daily bread. By the sweat of our brow, we gain our bread. And not just our bread, all of the other things that we experience and that we enjoy and that we derive pleasure from, it has a way of fascinating us and grabbing our attention and we pursue it for all we're worth and we get it and we consume it. And often as soon as the consumption is accomplished, the emptiness returns. And we're as empty as we ever were before. In fact, what culture in the history of the world has had more stuff to consume than you and I, the culture that we live in? It is a consumer culture, we call it. And yet the evidence is all around us and within us that we are not satisfied. And so the words of Jesus ring truer today, perhaps, than, than even then. Don't work for this, this food that spoils, this food that will not gain you anything in the final analysis. The food that, that won't keep and that you can't keep and that won't satisfy your deepest longings and your soul's greatest needs. But rather, he says, seek that bread which comes from above. Jesus nourishes us. He gives us strength. I remember, I can't recall on the moment uh, all the details of it. It's just now coming to mind, but there was a story I, I remember reading from uh, World War II in which there was uh, bread lines somewhere in Poland or someplace. And uh, a little girl later in life recounts the story of how she had waited in line for her little piece of, of bread and when it was finally given to her, she turned to walk away and she tripped and her piece of bread went into a, a mud puddle of water and was completely ruined. And she just sat there in her hunger and began to cry when another woman, an older woman, came along beside her and just took half of the little piece of bread that she had and gave it to her. And she talked about later how that bread that was given to her and that she was able to eat right there in that moment was help. But she said the thing that sustained her through the next several years of war and deprivation was the remembrance of the kindness of a woman who was willing to share what she had with her. That's spiritual sustenance, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is telling us that he came to give. He came to give us love and guidance. He came to give us truth. He, he came to give us mercy and to show us how to treat one another and how that we might find our way back to the Father. He came to be the way for us. Religion is all about man's pursuit of God, but Jesus is all about God's pursuit of man. He said, I came to seek and save what was lost. And so he is the bread who has come down from heaven. He is the manna from heaven. And it's, it's interesting to me to note as well that the, the Jews who here are listening to what Jesus said are scandalized by his statement and say, well, if you're going to claim to be the bread of heaven, then why don't you do something to back it up? Like Moses, who gave us bread in the wilderness, and, and, and Jesus had just the day before <laughs> given them bread, physical bread in the wilderness. But he tells them, you're not just seeking me because of who I am, but simply what I can do for you. But you need to see that I am. Ego eimi in the Greek which is the same words in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that God revealed himself to Moses by. 
who shall I say sent me? And he said, you shall tell them I am sent you. And Jesus says with those same words, I am the bread of life. I'm the very source of life itself. And the bread that I give you won't spoil, isn't just for the moment, well, it doesn't just get you through today, but it is a source that if you tap into and hold on to, will work into you and through you and be with you now and for eternity. And so his analogy that he is bread that satisfies us, that strengthens us, that nourishes us, all makes sense. But go back to what I was talking about at the beginning. It also makes sense that Jesus would, would describe himself as the bread of life and specifically as the manna that comes down from heaven because of the process that Jesus would endure in order to become our bread. He also went through a process of thrashing, of being pulverized into fine flour in order that he could become bread for us. Look with me, if you will, to Luke 22, beginning in verse uh, 39. Luke 22, verse 39. Changing the metaphor a little bit from the grinding of grain to produce flour for bread to the pressing of grapes or the pressing of olives to produce oil and drink. It says in verse 39 of, of Luke 22 that Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he arose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. This garden where this prayer in agony, where he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood is described. It, it, the word Gethsemane literally means the olive press. And again, this fitting analogy of the grinding of the pressure that was necessary in order for him to become bread for us. He could have remained in heaven, but he chose to come down like manna to become our life-giving bread, to be cut down, thrashed, and ground into fine flour. And so it's in that crushing, in that grinding, in that pressing that Jesus ultimately becomes the bread of of life, in order to give life to the world. And so it's fitting that at the Last Supper, Jesus would gather his disciples together and take bread and break it and extend it to them and say, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, we'll ask those who have been appointed to come and take charge of the supper.